Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator, and Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business. We credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone, so thank you for spending the evening with us. Um, I'm thrilled today to welcome Sara Abu Rashid and Asaf Calderon, along with editors Esther Farmer and Sarah Sills, for a discussion of the book A Land with a People, Palestinians and Jews Confront Zionism. Now to some housekeeping before we begin, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click on the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections, so please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to resolve them quickly. We have a great lineup of events planned for you as we head into spring, so head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is this Thursday, March 31st. We're very thrilled to collaborate with our friends at New York Review Books to welcome David Shields for his book, The Very Last Interview, in conversation with Laura Gibness. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Sara Abu Rashid is a Palestinian American poet and speaker. She was born and raised in Syria, but has lived in the United States since 2013. At 16, Sara delivered a TEDx talk and was nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Her works appear in the anthology, A Land with a People, and nine to 12 English language arts curriculum from McGraw Hill, and are forthcoming in Arab Lit Quarterly and Poetry Magazine. In 2018, Sara launched her autobiographical one woman show about immigration and finding home entitled A Map of Myself. She graduated from Denison University and is currently pursuing an MFA in creative writing at the University of Michigan. Asaf Calderon is an Israeli American social worker and anti apartheid activist. Asaf is a member of Jewish Voice for Peace NYC and is particularly interested in exploring the unique position that leftist Israeli Jews can play in opposing the Israeli state. Esther Farmer, who is a co-editor of A Land with the People, is a Palestinian Jew and native Brooklynite whose passion is using theater as a tool for community development. She is the director of Wrestling with Zionism, a reader's theater project that has been performed throughout the New York metropolitan area. She's the author of several published articles on theater and community development. She's an active member and on the leadership team of Jewish Voice for Peace NYC. And Sarah Sills, who is also a co-editor of A Land with the People, is a lifelong artist, activist, graphic designer, organizer, and event producer who has lived in Park Slope for over 25 years. In addition to being a JVP NYC chapter leader, she is currently involved with producing storytelling workshops and the Wrestling with Zionism Readers Theater. So without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you for thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Noah, for all of your support and to the Community Bookstore for having us. We are so grateful and delighted to be here. Our program tonight will begin with a story of how this book came to be and a bit about the book itself, uh, followed by poetry, stories, a conversation, and then a Q&A. First, for those who don't know the reference in the title, there is a Zionist trope that says that Israel was, quote, a land without a people for a people without a land. In fact, Palestine was a country with nearly 2 million people, hence the title, a land with a people. A number of years ago, our Jewish Voice for Peace chapter took a deep dive into the history of Zionism. Along the way, people were invited to break into small groups and share their personal stories and relationships to Zionism. We were all very moved by what people had to say, and these not often heard stories called out to be shared more widely. They touched our hearts because they were people's lived experiences and were often painful. Unlike political positions, you can't argue with someone's story. So from these mostly Jewish stories, our first book, Confronting Zionism, was born. Given the positive response to the book, Esther suggested we create a theater piece which became Wrestling with Zionism, a reader's theater. Over time, many of our Palestinians' friends joined us so that by 
our 10th performance, our cast was made up of half Palestinians and half Jews. It was clear that audiences were moved by the Palestinian stories about the impact Zionism had had on their lives and the Jewish stories of wrestling with and ultimately rejecting Zionism. Raz Pachesky, Esther, and I decided it was time for a second book, which became A Land with a People, Palestinians and Jews Confront Zionism, published by Monthly Review Press. With 22 personal stories, an impactful forward by Nora Arakat, a contextualizing history, a timeline of anti-Zionism going back to the 1800s, as well as poetry and art, our book reflects the long history of fighting the settler colonial politics of Zionism. This struggle has been led by Palestinians for over 100 years, a history that has been both invisibilized and distorted. A Land with a People also reclaims the powerful history of Jewish anti-Zionism, which the dominant Zionist narrative has greatly overshadowed. The editors and contributors of this book are proud of our unflinching look at the damage the damage Zionism has wrought. We acknowledge the vastly unequal power dynamics and are committed to changing that imbalance. To start us off, it gives me great pleasure to present Sarah Abu Rashad, who will share one of her poems. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah Sells, and everyone here at Community Bookstore, our lovely attendees. It's my pleasure to get us started with this poem of mine titled, For Rent. For Rent, an idea of a homeland 10,874 kilometers squared available, immediate, strategic location, name recognition, furnished, holy, aesthetic, excellent view, mountains, sea, desert, customizable borders and foundation, fertile soil staged with olive trees, cacti, oranges, inhabited, disposable, the inhabitants, landmark, subject to inspection, language to mutation. You may upgrade street names and transportation routes, pets and weapons allowed. All appliances included, plus barbed wire and prayer beads, comes with clubhouse, apartheid wall, pool, newsroom, ownership bonus upon signing. Thank you so much, Sarah. Now, I'd like to turn to Asaf. Thank you, Asaf, for sharing your story with us. Hey, all. nice to meet you. My name is Asaf, and I am, um, I was born in Israel, and uh, I'm currently living here in Flatbush. Um, and so my story, which appears in the book, um, is that I was born um, in Tel Aviv to uh, parents who, um, unlike most Israelis, uh, my parents, um, although they were Zionists, they were, uh, they consider themselves still to this day, they consider themselves um, left, leftist Zionists, uh, which is pretty similar to um, liberal Zionists here in the United States. Um, and my parents raised me with this, uh, belief that um, Zionism can be reconciled with um, liberal values and democracy if only we could um, get out of the West Bank um, and not taking into account um, a lot of the um, other, uh, the West Bank and Gaza actually, um, not taking into account a lot of the other um, issues that um, make Zionism what it is, um, including um, the Nakba, um, and the oppression of uh, Palestinian citizens uh, of Israel, as well as um, the refugees that are not allowed to return. Um, and I uh, eventually came to see this position as um, irreconcilable. Um, and what led me to do that was uh, that I, um, unlike most Israeli um, kids, um, ended up not serving in the military. 
um, serving in the military is obligatory, but you can get out of it um, for specific um, health reasons, which I happened to um, to have. And so I got an exemption. I didn't end up going to the army. And when you don't go to the army, it sort of puts you in a very um, unusual position where you are kind of um, um, kind of an outcast uh, in society and you start hanging out with other people who didn't go to the army. And so I ended up, um, uh, my views on um, Zionism have changed and now I see it as something that cannot be reconciled with uh, progressive values. Um, and uh, so I, when I came here, I became, uh, started organizing with Jewish Works for Peace and started um, uh, organizing as an anti-Zionist uh, activist. Um, I pass it along to, uh, to Esther. Thanks, Asa. So hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Esther, and um, I'm a Palestinian Jew whose father was born in Hebron, Palestine. And here in the States, especially in New York, people kind of think that's very unusual, but it really is not. Before Israel was created in 1948, the country was called Palestine, and 10% approximately of the population was Jewish, another 10% was Christian, and the rest were Muslim. So everyone who lived there was considered Palestinian. My family came here in the 20s. My grandfather today, like Asaf, was a refusenik. <laughs> he um, didn't believe in war and he was a Turkish Jew. He left Turkey because he didn't want to serve in the Turkish army. And he went to Palestine and lo and behold, Palestine was a Turkish protectorate, was controlled by Turkey. So he was drafted anyway. So that's how the family came to New York. Um, I grew up in a very staunch anti-Zionist household. My father always said that Israel was created on the backs of Palestinians who were made to pay for the Jewish Holocaust when they had nothing to do with it. So for the most part, um, in the family's history, Jews did very well in Palestine without very little of the angst that European Jews experienced. So along with our anti-Zionism, we were very culturally Jewish and very lefty. My, uh, the, the family story, one of the family stories is that my grandfather tried to prove that socialism was ordained in the Talmud. So in a way, my very existence gives the lie to the myth that to be anti-Zionist is to be anti-Jewish. In my house, my very Jewish parents were somewhat ashamed of Israel. It was a strange existence that we lived in a, we lived in a very Jewish and very Zionist neighborhood in Coney Island. And we, like everybody else, were bombarded by Jewish propaganda about the wonderful Israeli kibbutzim and how Israel was the new Jewish Mecca in civilization. One of the important goals of the book, as Sarah Sills described, is to reclaim the history of Jewish anti-Zionism because, you know, because of this unrelenting propaganda that we've all been, we've all experienced, people, many people don't realize that before 1948, there was substantial Jewish opposition to Zionism. And a land where the people reclaims this history, which has been so invisibilized. So I, like so many other Jews of my generation, came from a long progressive history. My father was a victim of McCarthy. He lost his job. He was blacklisted for over 10 years. And it was painful to see how the Jewish establishment moved to the right due to the influence of Zionism and how the mainstream Jewish community moved with them. So my father used to say it was a deal with the devil. This came to a head for me at Brooklyn College in 1970, which at that time was 95% Jewish, and where I witnessed the Zionist leadership as the main opposition to open admissions and to the establishment of ethnic studies department, particularly the Puerto Rican studies department and the Africana studies department. And it's kind of ironic because the struggle for ethnic studies landed up creating the first Judaic studies department in the city University of New York. So Zionist opposition landed up hurting Jews. 
And this has been a constant theme playing back over and over, as my father used to say, and the title of my story in our book, A Land with the People, which um, looks like this. <laughs> um, he used to say that the Zionists love Israel, but they don't love Jews. So I'm very proud this project has um, been an amazing and nourishing experience to see how much has been generated by wrestling with Zionism and now the book. We have a storytelling project that's around the country and people in synagogues are now both studying the book and also questioning Zionism where they weren't allowed to question Zionism before. So we're very excited about that. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah. And I'm going to pass the next um, story over to to you, Sarah. All right. Yeah. I saw in the chat two beautiful Sarahs, indeed. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you, Esther and Asaf, for your stories. Um, I guess mine is uh, related, although a bit different. My story begins back in 1948, where my grandparents and my ancestors lived married and worked the land. Um, my grandparents were born in Haifa, Palestine in the north, and in 1948 they were expelled from their city. They had to leave their homes and suddenly they found themselves as refugees in neighboring countries. They settled in Syria, in refugee camps in Syria that were set up to absorb um, all the newly displaced Palestinians. And funny enough, um, although all my grandparents are Palestinian, my great grandmother is Jewish. And she also moved and became a refugee because she didn't want to leave her Palestinian daughters. And that was her life. Her name was Tamara Zmirli. I talk about her a lot in the story in the book. Um, and how Tamara, as, as a Jew who became a Palestinian refugee, right, in these camps, um, shaped my life. Right? I am a great granddaughter um, who was born in the Palestinian camp in Syria in 1999, so I am 22 right now. And even though by the time I was born, the camp was not a camp at all, in fact, it was a city entirely for and by Palestinians who stayed since 1948. We still carried that title of refugee. I was born without a citizenship, neither Palestinian nor Syrian, because we were not technically citizens of either. So from a young age, I struggled with the outsider-insider identity. I was aware of my non-belonging. I knew that I was Palestinian in heart. I knew that I was not Syrian, even though I was surrounded by Syrians. Um, but I grew up with a strong sense of identity, right? I grew up with my grandparents. Um, I grew up with their accents, with the embroidery that I'm wearing, with their cuisine, with watching the news 24 seven, following the number of the dead, the number of the injured, um, right? following all, all the news um, as if we were still amidst the war. And even though our Palestinian neighborhood was a little bit isolated from the rest of the country, um, in 2011, when the Syrian war, before it was a war, it began as a revolution, unfortunately started getting closer to us. And day after day, we found ourselves um, caught in yet another displacement that forced people to leave our Elier Mouk camp, which is the neighborhood where I live. And with that, we came to the United States to be with my uncle. So we moved to Ohio. I was starting high school and I did not speak any English then. I was just thinking about this a few days ago and how crazy it is that it's been almost nine years since we moved to the United States. My entire family is now here, and I've been able to finish high school, continue writing poetry, something I've loved doing in Arabic, and now I do in English. Um, 
I moved on to study at the university, Denison University in Ohio. I did my bachelor's in international relations because I was so passionate about politics and the ways that identity influences other areas of our lives. And now I'm continuing on with my MFA in poetry at the University of Michigan because I believe in the power of storytelling. I believe in poems. I believe that someone is, has ought to do, to do this job of documenting history and stories in ways that we don't normally do. So I'm truly honored to, to be in the company of everyone and I look forward to your questions and our conversation. Thank you all for sharing those stories. So given that the three of you represent really, you span um, three different generations and um, you know, Sarah, you have grandparents and great grandparents and way back, you know, from, from Palestine, uh, Asaf, you know, you were born in Israel, your parents were born in Israel and Esther, you know, your father is from Hebron, from Palestine. I wanna ask you all um, how you are impacted by, you know, the reality that the occupation has now lasted so long. How, how has that impacted each of you? If you might talk, talk to that. Whoever wants to go first. Um. I can start. Um, okay. So for a very long time, I was so, I was ashamed. I feel like, I think I was ashamed of being Jewish. I was ashamed of what Israel was doing. And um, that kept me away from Jewish organizing spaces in the social justice work that I've done for so many years. And it's been interesting because one of the impacts of the Wrestling with Zionism project for me has been that it's brought me closer to the Jewish community. So it's also brought me closer to the Palestinian community because I can see the microaggressions every day that go on in the relationship between even allies, uh, Palestinian allies, Jewish allies of Palestinians. So I see both. And it's been an amazing experience both to get closer to the Jewish community and get closer to my parents who have been gone for many years. Um, there's a way that I feel closer to them than ever. And so for me right now to meet so many anti-Zionist Jews and Jewish voice with these is so nourishing. And you know, what, what we're learning is how important it is to be, to have those Jewish values that say we are Jews for justice, not just us. And that's such an important value that I feel Jewish voice for peace and so many of the younger Jews that are coming around hold. And that's very exciting to me. Thanks, Esther. Do either of you, Asaf or Sarah, want to respond to that question? Go ahead, Asaf. All right. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm um, third generation um, Israeli. Uh, my grandparents on both sides um, immigrated um, as, uh, as refugees. Um, my, uh, my grandparents came after the Holocaust for my mom's side. Um, and um, I think there's, there's this, um, in Israel there's this notion that uh, we have a collective trauma. Um, we have a collective trauma of um, the Holocaust, we have a collective trauma of other Jewish oppression all over the world. Um, and we have a collective trauma of this endless stream of conflicts that we um, are perpetuating and are like coming back to like um, to to hunt us right um, and what I think we're not talking about is how um, these collective traumas are affecting us as individuals um, and how they're actually personal traumas um, and how they make us because you know like when you um, when you experience trauma, 
um, you, I mean, you know, trauma, like it's, um, it's part of you, but it's not always uh, a very good guide. Um, and in Israeli society, we are society guided by trauma. And it's one of those things that it's one of, it's one of the um, driving forces, I think, um, that are driving us to make very poor choices. Um, and I think it is, to me, like it's, it's as, as, a, as, an, as an anti-Zionist Israeli, like I think that's part of like our job is to um, untangle that um, and um, see how we can um, move forward. Uh, move on um, from all of this harm that we're causing because um, it's uh, it's it's just um, not only is it not just it's also not sustainable. I guess a soft parallel to you. I'm a third generation Palestinian who lived in exile, who is is exiled. So for me, I consider myself even you know yet more Palestinian because I'm defined by what I'm lost, you know, but by what I lost and by what I can't get, which is recognition of my identity or even the opportunity to possibly visit Palestine, um, right? So I'm denied even that, that title. And sometimes funny things happen like meeting other Palestinians um, who are, you know, freshly immigrated and they say, oh no, you're Syrian. And yet Syrians themselves say, no, you're Palestinian. Uh, right, so the nuance of identity and the ways that it, it's relative depending on our environment. Um, and now in the US, right, people even say, no, you're American, right? Because I do have my American citizenship and that's the only nationality I hold. Um, and and the, the most recent, right? So um, it, I, I think about identity often. And for me, I've always, grown up knowing I'm Palestinian and the cause is inseparable from my personal story, from my lived life, wherever it may be. Sarah, can I just add one thing? You know, um, we recently did a television show where one of the questions was, well, okay, so it's been like 75 years um, or whatever, can we just move on? It's been so long, just going back to your question about the generational thing of, you know, this occupation has been going on for 75 years. And, you know, I have realized that just in terms of people, if, if you want peace, there has to be justice. And if we don't acknowledge the historical harm that has happened with Zionism, we really can't move forward because there will always be this underlying resentment. And it's not just underlying resentment, but I mean, it's a serious power differential. I mean, there is three human rights organizations, as many of you know, that have recently come out and said Israel, Israel is an apartheid state. So we can't just move on. And I have found that in, in being able to recognize the historical harm that has been done in Palestine, um, that's the point at which we can really start to heal both peoples. So I just want to say that relative to the to generation, the whole generational trauma of this. Absolutely. So I want to ask you a completely different question, just because of the moment we're living in right now with the horrific war that's going on in Ukraine. I want to ask each of you to talk a bit about um, what's coming up for you vis-a-vis -vis Israel Palestine, um, given the undivided attention that's being given to Ukraine, um, this horrible war. Asaf, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I mean, the first thing I can uh, that comes to mind um, is just how, I mean, <laughs> looking at it from like how Israel uh, or how Israelis are thinking about Ukraine, I mean, a lot of Israelis, uh, first of all, a lot of Israelis have Ukrainian roots, but also a lot of Israelis are supporting the Ukrainian people. Government, not so much. The government kind of is hedging its bets, right? Because uh, that's what they do. Um, but um, the Israeli 
people are uh, generally very open to um, accepting Ukrainian refugees, supporting Ukrainian people, um, which is insane. It is insane. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's great, right? Like, uh, you know, like we should, we, uh, this country especially, we should uh, accept Ukrainian refugees. It's very important. But the fact that Israelis um, are so sort of, um, uh, so emotionally open to the plight of these people, uh, but cannot see neither. No, they cannot see the refugees that they themselves, that we ourselves have created. There are people still alive who we have um, caused to uh, to 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 become refugees. Um, in including right like like Sarah's family right like people who are um, who are who have never even been to the the homeland um, because we 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 expel their families um, and the, the connection is not being made there is just this complete sort of um, disconnect uh, because there is this you know exceptionalism. Um, that is uh, afforded. By the way, uh, it, it's not to everyone. It's to, it's to it's to Europeans in particular, because Israel has also refused to accept uh, African refugees. Um, so it is uh, the the disconnect is just unbelievable. Sarah or Esther, do you have something to add? Sarah, do you want to take it or? Sure, I'll, I'll say a few things. Um, first, I'll say personally, I think it's an unnecessary war and I wish it, it never happened, it never started. But since it happened, I saw friends who never considered themselves political suddenly take a stance. And it showed me that people are capable of solidarity, that people are capable of awareness of um, you know, of asking for justice. People are capable of seeing what's right and what's wrong. Um, and it's not very different than, than other wars. So what, what is the difference there? I, I think it shows us the hypocrisy of, um, of people, of governments, of our own selves sometimes. And just speaking of language, since, since I write poetry and I'm very um, involved in, in, you know, in thinking about language, something that stood out to me is the way people suddenly were aware even of the spelling of the capital city of Ukraine, whether you use the Ukrainian spelling or the Russian to signal your political stance, right? Something so small as a single letter became significant on social media, on different areas. And so the question I asked myself is how could this not be applied to Israel and Palestine? Is it not the exact same? Because we're, we're dealing with language, we're dealing with, with names and renames. Um, so again, the question of land, the question of occupation, I wish, I wish we would do better by each other. Yeah, I, just to add to that, Sarah, um, you know, it's kind of amazing watching television and seeing that the grandmothers who are making Molotov cocktails in the Ukraine are considered uh, freedom fighters and heroes. And the young kids who are throwing stones at Israeli tanks are terrorists. So Palestinians are constantly, uh, they're depicted in the media as terrorists doing the same thing that they're doing in the Ukraine and their freedom fighters. So you can really see the hypocrisy and the stark difference in the narrative. Um, you know, whether it's racism, which I'm sure is a big part of it. Um, it's the um, historical right of these, you know, big powers to do whatever the hell they want. Um, the hypocrisy, as Sarah said, is really in your face here. So it's an important thing. I, we have a Palestinian friend who is working in Germany um, from a group that we support called the Palestinian House of Friendship. And he's working with Ukrainian refugees. And I always think about like, what could that possibly mean for a Palestinian who was working to support Ukrainian refugees when they don't have the right to visit their families um, in Palestine? So it's really in your face. 
Indeed. So I'm going to move on for a minute and, and uh, now and just ask you all to share a couple of things about your stories and how you have each been impacted by sharing your stories. And also, if you were to write your story today, how might it be different from the one you wrote when you were invited to contribute? Sarah, do you want to go now first or? <laughs> um, I, I, I'll think for a minute. Maybe I'll try sure. to pass up. Sure, if somebody else wants to. Yeah, I can, I can go on. Um, I think one thing that, um, so like, I, I think like my, my text ended up being pretty, um, it was, it's personal, but it's like, it's, it's very much about like ideology, um, which I think is the place I was in because I wasn't really at, at the time, you know, six years ago, because I wasn't really, um, as, as ready as I am now to, um, talk about like the emotional aspect of all of this. Um, and I think that it's something that we really need to, I mean, it's a whole a really complicated subject. Like, how do we talk about the emotional and th about the trauma and the emotional pain of the settler, of the occupier? And it's not just that we need to talk about it um, because, um, you know, like, I, I don't like, like it's it's a, it's a politically complicated issue but the truth is that um it is a driving force in our um in the oppression that we are perpetuating um and it's something that we need to learn how to talk about and so that's something that i would have wanted to uh, that i would have addressed if i you know if i were to write it today yeah. we need to learn to talk about it because like i mean even today there was um, a shootout in uh, near tel aviv in Israel, right and i think um we uh, in the left it's very hard for us to speak about it um because you are you fall you fall into this uh, zionist sort of trap right well um if you identify with the pain of the victim you are um uh, it's, it's like you're taking sides right? it's like you're taking the side of the zionist but i what, what i want to say is the pain of these victims is the result of Zionist policy um, is the result of uh, years and years of uh, Zionist oppression. Um, and my pain too is, is the result of that. And so I would have wanted to talk about that. Thanks, Asaf. How about you, either of you? For me, um, Asaf, that's really interesting hearing you talk about how you would have written something different. Um, I'm rereading over my story, which has been submitted for a few years now, right? It takes a long time to, to get a book made. Um, and I don't think it would be different. In fact, I think it would um, be more or less the same, except there's more of it, right? Over the past few years, I've matured, I've um, kind of picked settled or reconciled all these different issues with identities. In the book, I talk about the many displacements I personally experienced, as well as my family. Um, now I'm almost at peace with not having a home or a homeland. I think that's something recent for me. It might have to do with college or with age that suddenly I, I accept all that has happened. And I I continued, you know, writing politically as I usually do, but it's, it's with more peace, internal peace. And I wish I would have arrived at that earlier. Thanks for that. But just, just quickly for me, you know, so many of the stories in our book from the Jewish side are people who had been on a journey around Zionism and they started having questions 
uh, you know, one of the interesting things is Jews are known for questioning everything, but this was something we weren't allowed to question. At the dinner table, in our storytelling projects, we asked, what were you not allowed to say at the dinner table? You know, so a lot of people, they talk about their transformation and their journeys away from Zionism. And for me, I didn't have to go through that. So because it's kind of in my blood, it was always there. But because writing this and being involved with all the stories, stories are so powerful. They're not a polemic there. You know, as Sarah said earlier, there are people's lived experience. And I, I think I would have liked to explore more the um, emotions that go on between peoples because of this. And it had brought me, as I said, closer both to the Jewish community and also to the Palestinian community. And so when I look at it now, I think I would like to explore that more. Great. Well, maybe you'll all have another opportunity. <laughs> we can help. Uh, so first of all, I just want to encourage the audience to um, put any questions you may have in the chat. And I wanted to, um, before we go to the questions and answers, um, I would like to play a very short video um, that is from last may it was at a an action um a shabbat for palestine in grand army plaza uh during the palestinian uprising when there were a lot of protests around the evictions in sheikh Jarrah that are still going on so we're going to share that video and then we'll go to q a People gotta try to tell you, you don't see the complexity. You don't see the nuance. And you don't know those both sides. But let's be real, most of us grew up in Zionist households and in Zionist institutions. So what are they talking about? We had to undergo massive processes of transformation to get here. We know the sides, we know the humanity of our own people, and we know truth when we see it. People gonna tell you, you don't know enough. Right. You think you know, but you don't know enough. Right. You didn't read that book. You don't know that date. Nah, you know enough. Yep. Yeah. You saw those bombs. Yeah. You saw those lynch mobs. Yeah. You know enough. Yeah. By all means, keep learning. By all means, there are tons of amazing resources out there. Keep learning, but you will know enough. Yeah. Lead with your values. If you know your values, you know enough. Oof. Okay. Well, with that, I would like to take some of the questions. I will um, share some of the questions in the chat. Um, the first one I'm going to pose is... Um, can each of you describe a national and political future for people who identify as Israelis and Palestinians that you would be able to support? There's a way that I want Asa to, <laughs> to maybe talk to that question. Sure. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's interesting. Like, it's, it's, um, I think part of why we uh, made this book is because uh, we think that personal stories are uh, more powerful than like political um, formulations. But that said, I do have my, my own opinions, right? Um, and I support the one state solution wholeheartedly. I think there's no other solution other than one democratic, truly democratic state um, where everyone gets to vote and where um, the refugees are allowed to return to their lands. I think everything else is a waste of time, is obfuscation, it's, and it's delaying the inevitable. I think for me, um, you know, I'm a supporter. We don't talk about this in the book because the book is, is a storytelling book in a historical context. But for me, I'm, I'm a supporter of the boycott divestment and sanctions movement because the the demands of that movement are 
eminently reasonable. Um, they are an end to the occupation, um, the right of return for people to be able to go to their homes and equal rights. And so for me, any justice loving person um, would have to support that. I don't have a particular, I don't have an answer. I don't know one state, two states. I mean, there's lots of um, people who think very differently about this and, and it's not up to us. You know, I live here, you know, I'm a New Yorker. Um, so I don't think I have a right to say this is what other people should figure out. But certainly um, an end to the occupation and equal rights is beyond reasonable. I think that's a precursor to any solution. I just want to thank the person who asked that question, because that's a, a question you ask when you're listening. Um, right? What, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? I've never personally been asked that. Um, and I, and for that, I've never thought of it, you know, in terms of political formation and everything, but I want a unified country where all of us can live with our differences, without violence, without checkpoints, without um, hatred, right? And, and it happens. Look at the United States, look at anywhere else, um, you know, it happens every day that people live as, you know, as different as they may be. Why can't we do that in the area that is Palestine and Israel? We want an end to the occupation. We want justice. We want these displaced people who were almost a million, but now many millions to return. Thanks all. Okay. Um, Another question here. Um, it seems like there's been a major sea change since 2014 regarding the mainstream American stance on Palestinian liberation. First of all, do you agree? And what do you think has caused that shift? Well, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, and just in the years that I've been, I came here in 2016, just in the years that I've been here, we've seen major, major, major change. And that's what makes me hopeful. Um, and I think for me, the most important thing that's happening is that Palestine has become part of the progressive agenda, um, especially for um, like, for 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 political leaders who are, uh, who are who are who are suffering their own oppression here in the United States, or primarily people of color, right? Um, who are leading this? Um, so that includes Palestinian activists, but also um, but also African American activists and others who are um, just leading the charge on this. And you know, as um, as, uh, as 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 you know, like. Um, as an Israeli white Jew, like uh, all I can do is like you know play my part um, and support this wonderful movement for for global justice that that's happening here. Yeah, I I, I think that there has been a major change, and and as in so many other instances, our politicians are way behind where people are at with this because more and more people are saying no way and particularly young Jews and many observant religious young Jews are saying no way, not in our name. Um, and that's that's extremely moralizing. Uh, I think the, both the Democrats and the Republicans and, and the Democrats um, have been way behind relative to the, the leadership of what's happening. And I think part of the reason for that is that it's since 2014 when people saw bombs you know, as we showed in the video being thrown on children and there were more Palestinian and gods and children have died than Ukrainian children. And of course, we didn't hear about that as much, but certainly people in this country began to see that. So part of this is just that what's happening in Israel is so egregious that people can't take it anymore. But the main reason I think is that Palestinians have been leading this fight for 75 years. And we, as allies of Palestinians or uh, in Jewish Voice for Peace, we have been at it trying to change the narrative. So I think, you know, all of those things have contributed to this big sea change, and it's about time. I'm also hopeful that social media is finally, um, you know, shining a light on Palestine. Um, 
I think what we saw last summer just showed what people are capable of. And any reasonable person who calls for justice for um, you know, Black Lives Matter, for indigenous communities is able to see the connections with the Palestinian cause. So there is more opportunities for solidarity. I want, I want to say just about like, you know, in, in 2014, yes, there was a really brutal, horrible attack on Gaza, and that was part of it. But it wasn't the first one. There's been, Israel has been murdering people for 70 years. And um, so it's not like, it, it wasn't like a, just a reactive thing, but like something really hap horrible happened there and that's gonna work, work us up. It's no, it's like people in this country are waking up and then this happened and sort of pushed some people over the edge. But like, it's, it's um, we should give credit to all of the um, activists and organizers that, that have been waking this country up to just justice in general, right? Absolutely. So just getting back to uh, Ukraine for a minute, um, one question is uh, why is BDS against Russia good while laws are being passed against, you know, BDS that's against Israel? So can any of you speak to that double standard? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an important question to consider the role of the United States um, in keeping this going for so long. I mean, for 75 years, we've been, you know, we practically built the Israeli army. <laughs> it's our tax dollars that are going to this, uh, something that completely, you know, is so outrageous. You know, we gave $3.8 billion a year for Israel to do what it's doing in Gaza and, and in the West Bank. So the United States has a lot to do with it. I mean, I remember my father saying that, you know, uh, the United States, um, they wanted Israel for their own interest, and it wasn't because they loved Jews so much. So that history uh, is an important thing to remember, the role of US colonialism in propping this, this thing up, I think is very important. And, and also that, you know, we reclaim that history that, you know, Jews as a community were used by bigger powers um, during that time in 1948. And of course, after the Holocaust, Jews were very concerned about safety. And yes, that makes absolute sense. And so they kind of made this deal to create Israel, which there were many Jews. And at one point, it was the majority of Jews actually, that said, no, this is not a good deal. And this, you know, my father was one of those people who said, this is not going to help anybody. It's not going to help Jews. It's not going to help anybody in the world. So um, it's just going to create more division, uh, which it did. So I think the role of the United States in this is just this really important thing to think about. And the fact that it's all relative, right? We're whichever country we deem to be our, our friend or our enemy at the time, um, that's where the public reaction comes in. But ultimately it's the same. If you oppose one occupier, then you must oppose all. Yeah. Um, and I will add that, I mean, I like, I, I support boycotts on, on Russia, right? But um, the, Israeli citizens, unlike Russian citizens, um, actually do get to vote. Um, so in, in a way, like boycotting, like because there's no democracy in Russia. In Israel, there's no democracy, but citizens do get to vote and they do vote for these governments in a way that the Russian people does not vote for Putin. Uh, the elections are real, right? Not everybody gets to vote. Those who get to vote, vote. And putting pressure on the Israeli people is going to be more effective than putting pressure on the Russian people because they can vote these uh, governments out. Um, what could happen, I don't know if it will happen, but what could happen if the BDS uh, campaign um, succeeds um, is that eventually there's going to rise a party that's willing to open democracy for everyone um, out of pressure. This can only happen out of pressure. Um, but it could happen, you know, legally it could happen, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I support the workers in Russia, but the workers in Israel is actually, is, is more morally, is, is, is morally uh, um, simpler, actually. <laughs> and strategically more effective. 
true. Okay, well, one more question before we close, which is, um, can you talk a little bit about the response to the book? Um, have you heard back from people who've read the stories and how they've been impacted by them? So if you can share, um, that would be great. Well, I can start. Um, I've been so incredibly thrilled with the response so far. We, we're, we almost can't keep up with <laughs> the invitations that we're getting to speak. Uh, uh, bookstores such as this, uh, universities, uh, we did a television show recently. It, it's in, people are reviewing the book in different circles, community development circles, academia. So um, that's been wonderful. Um, also, there's another question there that I see about the Black Lives Matter and the relationship, and I think that's really an important connection because that's one of the things we didn't mention as to, you know, the recent upsurge in pro-Palestinian thinking and looking at Israel, and that has so much to do with Black Lives Matter, and we, we have to give credit where credit is due. That's been an amazing um, up upswing of support because of that movement in the states and what we do here does make a big impact i think you know what asaf said earlier about how it does uh make a real difference because people in israel the israeli jews can vote of course palestinians can't in so many cases but um they can do something about this so that that makes a very big difference what we do here and that was one of our goals for the book is to um we want to see some action. We, we want to see that, you know, Palestinians have been kind of, in a way, many Palestinians feel they've been abandoned by the world. And when you see the narrative, you see that. And that's changing now, and that's wonderful. But we want to see this book uh, be a catalyst for continuing to change that narrative and for some concrete policy and action to end this occupation. For me, I'm very proud of this book and of the way it tried to um, invite Palestinians and Jews to, to speak to their experiences. Because if you heard Sarah in, in the beginning and in the intro, she said something really powerful. That is, we can argue political opinions, but we can't argue stories. And stories are very powerful. They change minds and hearts. Um, right, they invite us to each other's experiences. And I hear back from people who read my poetry all the time. And many of them, you know, have never experienced what I did. So in a way, it's it's a window and a mirror, right? It's an invitation to something different. And it's a reflection of what other people have suffered. Um, my hope is that more people continue to learn from stories, continue to, to look for stories and keep an open mind. I did see some, you know, not very pleasant comments just, just right now. And um, that's that's why we're here, because we're trying to speak, you know, all of us to, to reach each other, to say, this is what I've lived and this is what happened to me. Um, I can't help that you disagree, but I, I can help that we can talk about it. Right, so the you know there's a whole sort of section of my of my life uh, people that I, I didn't even show it. <laughs> um, I, I I don't think it's like actually helpful to engage with um, Israeli like Zionists like on this like one on one basis. Like I'm gonna convince you. I'm not gonna convince most people, um, and that's fine. Um, what's important is uh, there's a reason why you know like. Like, I really think the work is here. <laughs> like, um, what's most important is uh, talking to folks like you and um, getting, uh, you know, like, getting folks here uh, to, to care about this and to, um, and to support uh, the struggle. And I'm glad that uh, we get to be a part of that. Me too. I'm very grateful to have been a part of this um, and to to hear your stories. It was it was very moving. And thank you so much for for sharing them with us. I'm glad that we could be a platform for this conversation. Um, thanks again, all four of you, for the really wonderful conversation. Those of you at home, thank you for your 
extremely thoughtful questions. And please consider purchasing a copy of A Land Without, With a People, excuse me, from Community Bookstore, um, A Land With a People. And we hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care.